Well, this is something, a topic I've been interested in for a long time. Let me introduce myself. My name is Al Katz. I'm a faculty, a longtime faculty here at TCNJ in the electrical and computer engineering department. And I uh, should make my, uh, my uh, statements about that this is not, does not represent the views of the College of New Jersey or any of my employers or consultants. This is just kind of my uh, thoughts on, on, on this uh, subject. Uh, I was involved in the very beginning of the uh, computer festival back in 1976, boy, it doesn't seem, boy, that's a long time ago. I add that 19 to it, right? <laughs> Rather than the 20. And what I have up here is just a, a, uh, a thing from the publicity that followed the first Trenton Computer Festival. This was from the International Herald uh, Tribune. And it just shows a, a, a fanciful uh, concept of where computers might be going in 1976. Uh, so people were thinking about uh, computers being more than just computers, even uh, back at that time. And I should say, please, I, I originally envisioned this as an interactive session. So if you have comments or ideas, don't be afraid to break in and say, hey, I've got this idea uh, about, this, uh, about the, this, this topic. Please, uh, in fact, do that. You take me off the, the, the hook uh, here. This session will look at uh, the possibility of electronic-based life forms. I'm sure most of you probably have thought about that, uh, what it means. And I thought I'd say a little bit, you know, what am I doing here? I'm a, you know, this electrical professor who teaches circuits and how electronics, what am I thinking about different life forms, okay? Uh, so I, I wanted to talk about how I got interested in this. I'm, I, my area, I should have a guessing contest. Anyone here know? what my specialty is, you know, French literature sounds good. I had to read French. Uh, fortunately, I didn't have to, I didn't have to speak it. <laughs> I did not have to speak it. I wouldn't be, be here probably. Microwave amplifiers? Yeah, I'm, my, my specialty is in, in microwaves. Actually, it's in specifically in distortion, but that relates primarily to power amplifiers. So this is a long way from my uh, area, I'll say, of, of somewhat expertise, question mark, question mark expertise. Uh, and uh, anyhow, uh, so I'm going to talk about this. I'm going to talk a little bit about basics, very, very basic basics on how computers work. And then I, with this topic of uh, generative AI, I thought I'd say, talk a little bit about generative AI, probably going to get the most technical in that, but I didn't feel I had the time available uh, to do as much as I like. I probably should, I'm, a, I'm assuming that there's so many talks today on generative AI that you probably are up to here with generative AI at this particular uh, point. And then I'll, I'll get into the real question here, related questions on, uh, on other life forms and how it might start and where we may be going, okay? So that's the, idea behind this this and uh, the genesis where, where did this start you know this idea about having other life forms well back in the days when i did my doctorate my doctorate really was in communications systems not even a microwave engineer in terms of my doctorate i just you know you go you go where work takes you right and work work took me very strongly in the microwave area mainly because I'm a ham radio operator, which uh, and I've been a ham radio operator since I was 13 years of age. And I wanted to be ham radio, ham radio operator, I think, since I was about eight years old uh, and heard about it. So uh, I, ha I had some background uh, on these things. My doctorate was a, a comm systems doctorate uh, and it involved finding signals in uh, in terms of their frequency, and everyone knows what a frequency is, the dial you dial on your receiver, and how long they are on. And it, it is an interesting problem because you have a, an uncertainty issue here. The more accurately you can define the frequency a signal is on, the longer you need to look at that signal. And this is uh, one of those uh, uncertainties. 
that you, you have. And I, so I was looking at ways of doing this. And I got into this area of what I call lateral inhibition, uh, which is part of the, the, here are the neural networks don't talk very much about lateral inhibition. It's very interesting, but it's part of it that the network looks horizontally. Most of what's being done right now does not look horizontally is my understanding of artificial in, intelligence. It primarily looks vertical. But if you look horizontally, you can make decisions among your various uh, neural uh, networks or, or parallel paths. And this, I think, still has value even today. I want to get into it uh, as a type of pre-processing we're looking for, for patterns. So I was looking at ways in what I called multiple parallel channels of deciding what frequency a signal was on, but also being able to do it in a very quick period of time. And one of the things that I I got involved with this in application is understanding how the hearing system works, which is, you know, it's a, it's a big neural processing, a big neural network. And I could, again, spend a whole talk here talking about hearing. I should ask my wife, who I see is in the audience here, rating me on how I speak. She's a speech person. Uh, so I'll hear it at the end of this talk. But, uh, and so one of the applications, and I put that on, I actually was looking for, uh, when I, and putting this together, uh, some of my diagrams in terms of uh, neural networks and lateral inhibition, how that worked to show you. But uh, in the time I had available to put this talk together, I just didn't have the time to go back and pull up my, uh, I have it, my doctoral work. And I didn't, when I did my doctorate, computers uh, were, you know, punch cards. That was the level of, of computers to, to date myself a little bit uh, there. So, but I have, I have the hardware in, on paper. And I'm going to probably do this as a result of doing this. This talk here is to get some of those, those diagrams around so you can see that this really is a neural processing. This shows you a concept which I got into due to the, uh, my, my wife's influence in making up aids for the handicap. We were looking at models of the hearing system. And one of the things that you pick up when you look at the, the hearing system is that you have a, a, a bunch of parallel channels that hearing system does its its understanding of speech when you get into that very much based on frequency it's not based on the waveform it's not based on phase it's based on the on the frequency and one of the concepts here is that you look at these various channels that you put it that you look at it and one of the things that the uh, i think to me was pretty obvious that when you take signals and the signals that are received in the ears they go to the cortex of the brain. And with the cortex of the brain, a simple way of looking at it is like a moving picture. So a lot of the work which, which had been done with uh, different alternate hearing, you have this one string and they would put that one string on there and you have to remember what happens in the pattern. So one of the first things we looked at is producing a window so you can compare time ways as well as, as horizontally. And then the next step in this was to do some of this parallel processing so you could center in and they, again, if I get into the biological, the way we sense, we, there's a lot of, 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 of data that indicates the way we process and that we find edges and centers of, of stimulation, uh, whether it's sound or if it's vision, uh, we first refer to as mock, mock bands and vision, tactile sense, it, it, it was this great parallelism in, in terms of processing. So I, I got involved very early on in uh, in, in neural networks and, and processing and looking at the, uh, the, the fact that uh, neural processing can be very useful, a useful technique. And uh, at uh, TCNJ, I became interested in microprocessing. Microprocessors came out and I said, oh, this is going to be very important, even though I was this e &M person, electromagnetic person, and uh, I realized that microprocessors are going to be very important. This is the early, early days. That's why I'm here with the Trenton Computer Festival, because I got interested in the, the importance of microprocessing these small processors while, while, rather than the big processors. And I, I, I realized this would be a very important part of the curriculum. And there was no one else back then who knew anything about microprocessors. So I ended up teaching the microprocessors. I was teaching the assembly language, computer design. Here at the same time, I was doing the microwave. But as time went by, 
Uh, we, of course, had a wealth of people who know something about computers. And so I can step back and go back into my area of electromagnetics, which there were much fewer number of people uh, involved in, but I remained involved with the uh, with the computer festival and computers as the side. But that instance uh, led me to think about the, the, the capabilities of computers. And that's the last line here as a result. I started to think about could computers think in a way like humans? And I got to be very careful because we could spend, again, philosophically, what does it mean to be aware of your existence? That's a whole issue. You know, where does that, that, that happen? But if we just say, think in a way that uh, is like humans, that's a little, you know, a little broader, a little easier to take. Uh, and is an electronic computer, I call an electronic computer life form, depending on what you define as a life form. You define it as thinking like a computer. In the early days of, uh, of uh, computing, there were tests to say, well, was a computer like a human being? Uh, there was the Turing test, which can you tell the difference between talking or communicating with a computer and another human being? And if you couldn't tell the difference, uh, then you had a computer thinking like a human. And of course, all those tests have been vastly, you know, uh, achieved. Uh, you know, uh, you, you can certainly simulate, and I'll call it that, you can get machines that act very much like humans. And you, it's very difficult, if not impossible, to tell whether you're talking to a, uh, a, a computer. Uh, they've all passed the so-called Turing test. Uh, so uh, if we go on from, from that concept uh, that there is a possibility, I was going to just uh, talk about uh, the fact that if we're going to look at what's going to happen in the future and we're going to have computers that already are thinking like human beings, will they act with some of the other things that we associate with being human beings, like emotions, uh, different values and here, I'm not going to give you the answers because I don't have the answers to these questions. And I think there's the philosophers are going to be really working on this for quite a, a, a period of time. I can tell you the biologists do not know. I've talked to a lot of biologists and I say, oh, you know, you got this system and you look at this si simple system. Now, you know, it has a logic system. You look at some, one of the uh, simplest, like uh, a horseshoe crab or some sort of simple uh, life form that has has very little logic, but it has logic in it. And I say, when does this type of, of life form know that it exists or thinks that it exists? And the biologists don't seem to have any idea uh, or don't give me any <laughs> answers to that question. So, but to understand the future, uh, I, as someone said, I forget who it was, it wasn't Santa Ana, you must understand the past. Uh, and uh, in truth, we don't have a great track record of predicting uh, the future. Uh, you know, as you, the further back you are, you say, I, I guess I can remember the times when I was starting up here with the computer festival and people would talk about questions, would you have a computer in the home? And I'd get, <laughs> I never have a computer in my, in my home. Uh, there's no possibility of that. So we, in general, we don't have a great track record. The picture you see on the screen is a boyhood friend of mine attempt at making a computer uh, in the early days. This is at the same time the first uh, simple uh, computers came out, personal computers, and he put something together in terms of logic. And he says that his cat came in and knocked the whole thing off the table, but it still worked. This is the cover, if anyone goes back far enough, remembers Byte Magazine. This was the second cover of Byte Magazine, which shows his computer, he called it the spider uh, there. So early attempts at making computer out of simple logic. Uh, and so if we go back to the history and we say, what did people expect? How did this process come on? How did we get where we are? And some of the things that started up historically, you know, we talk about the production of weaving, these weaving machines. That was the first step really of computing, mechanical computing, but they figured out how to make patterns uh, how to design patterns. We go back to IBM. The beginning of IBM uh, was 
uh, a machine to take the census, keeping track of the data from the census. And then a very important part of what we think about in the general term of computers is mechanical to electrical electronics, where we have sensors that pick things up mechanically, the computer processes, and then sends the result back to the uh, to the electronic or mechanical circuitry. As some people refer to this as megatronics, uh, this combination of mechanical. And the truth is, if you are into control theory and work in that specialty of the electrical engineering spectrum, everything has pretty much gone to digital. Rather than doing the, the, the stuff uh, in terms of electrical circuits, uh, the, the processing is done digitally and then it's sent back rather than having a, we refer to as analog. And maybe I, for a general audience here, when I say analog, I'm talking about using circuit elements, basic circuit elements, resistors, capacitors, inductors, in, in doing the processing. You just take the whole, the whole thing comes in, use a device called a A to D converter to convert the analog signal to digital. And then the digital signal goes into a computer and the computer does the processing and says, oh, I got to move this thing this way. And then it goes the opposite way through a thing called a digital to analog computer and it controls the, the process. So this is an important. Another big thing in the history of where we got to and where we are is what's called integrated circuits or LSI, which stands for large scale integrated circuits, the ability to put more and more devices on a chip. So we have situations where we have today millions and millions of logic devices on a, on a single chip. And I, I, I'm gonna say further on here, this gets more and more like or similar human similarities to humans because we have more and more elements. The brain has a huge number of elements but as we'll see, it, uh, we're, we're really, even today, I'm not even getting us to the future, the situation we have today is we're really getting competitive in terms of the number of processing elements that we have available to us to that available in the human brain. It's hard to believe, but that's part of a, another revolution that I'm gonna talk about in a moment, uh, I guess I'm here. I tried to talk about, for people who are not familiar with computing, the concept of computing in the beginning was, was a program that tells you where to go. It's like a set of instructions. This goes back to that, uh, the original looms. Uh, you have a set of instructions, you follow those instructions and the machine does it. The difference between a simple process that does, says do step one, do step two, do step three, and the type of what we refer to as a computer today is that the computer is basically a general device. Uh, it's not a box for a specific job. The, the beauty of the computer was that it could be programmed to do many, many jobs. So you just didn't build up a, a loom, you built up a, uh, to control a loom, you had a box that you could pro program to control a loom or control a rocket ship that's going through space. It was this generalized instrument. Uh, that can be programmed to do just about anything. And that was the situation in 1976 when the computer festival started off. We started to have this ability to make computers that were relatively small and easy, but still have this generalized possibility to be able to be programmed to do what you want it to do. Okay. Uh, and then we, at that particular time, what were you we going to do with the, with computers? I, I'm not going to embarrass you and start asking questions here. You know, what can you do with a computer and think about it? We're going back almost 50 years, and what did we think about doing back then? Well, you, you, we started talking about we're going to have computers and appliances, which of course we do have, because we brought the cost of that computer down. So it's rather than building some sort of mechanical device to make it work, you go to the concept I talked about before, a, uh, a to D process D to A, and you could pay to put that into not just one place, it may be three or four different places inside an appliance uh, today. So computers and appliances and devices are, are common, common. And of course, back then we started to talk about computers in com commerce. And even in 1976, 
we were into computers and commerce. Computers in everyday life, this is what I was saying before, I used to get the biggest laughs when I would go and interview. We used to you know, start to promote the computer festival. And we said, oh, personal computers are coming. You're going to have these. And people would literally laugh at me uh, on the concept of having a computer in their home. So we're certainly there today. And they talked about computers and education. And again, that question mark is a, uh, uh, in 1976, or the beginnings of the computer festival, that was still a question. Today, there's no question. We're seeing more and more integration of computers into the learning process, into the classrooms. We're still not really quite where we should be, but we're, we are definitely getting there. And then we talk about internet and electronic mail. And I had a, a lot of question marks. In 1976, most people had no idea what the internet was. Uh, they didn't, this concept of electronic mail uh, wasn't there. We certainly have, historically, we've uh, uh, gotten there. Uh, I, one of the questions I like to ask back then, trying to judge what are the capabilities, as we're talking about, how different are our concepts and what the capabilities are of the computer, you know, so what is the big application? And at the time, People didn't even have the idea of word processing and documents. I mean, to people who understood personal computers back then, they were into that. But I can remember at a situation here, and I, I guess, uh, you know, this is antidotal or antidotal, antidotal uh, comment here. I had, a, I had a secretary in my department, and I, I set her up with a uh, personal computer to do all our, 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 our word work, word processing, okay? At the same time, the school decided that they were going to convert all the secretaries to get a word processor. So they paid $50,000 to something that was a couple thousand dollars and brought it for the whole school. And I remember being a command, says, how can you do this? You know, and of course, within two or three years, maybe that's a little exaggeration, but five years, all those word processors are obsolete and everyone was using personal computing. So, uh, but even back then, people recognized that that was going to be one of the big applications. I don't think using the computer for solving, doing computation was appreciated as much as today. I mean, we don't do anything without computer modeling, using the computer as our, uh, as our primarily design solution tool. And uh, back then, people hadn't gotten the idea that computers would be really big in entertainment, right? You know, if you, uh, I probably, if we look at this, one of the principal uses uses of computers today is for entertainment, right? We're all looking at movies, we're all looking at shows, music, where does it come from? It's all communications on our computer. I was just looking for my cell phone here so I could catch up on the latest entertainment while I'm talking on the side. That has to, that has to do with a uh, this multi-user state of human beings today. Uh, you know, how many of you are frustrated by the amount, the level of multiprocessing we have to do as human beings, as an older person, right? And uh, I think younger people are easier, handle this easier because they've grown up with it, but this concept of multiprocessing. And part of that is the result of what I highlighted in red here is what computers have done to communications. I mean, we're all connected. We're communicating. Uh, I remember giving this talk and talking on, focusing on the communications and the things and saying, uh, you're gonna have cell phones built into your brain, you know, built into your body. And people look, oh no, nah, never, never, never. Now, a lot of people still say that, but a lot of people don't look at it that as, as being crazy. They look at that as a, as a real possibility in a few years. Uh, be honest, you know, uh, particularly if you're younger, you don't feel particularly, uh, you know, how should I put it, uh, worried about having a cell phone attached to you. So you can just, oh, I'm going to call my friend and think it. Uh, I certainly do believe, I don't know, how many people think we're going to have, have cell phones as part of us? Nobody? Am I the only one here? Yeah. I'm not saying next next year, but it, 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 it you know, and there are a lot of ways this can be done without having a major operation. There's a lot of ways to interface. We're, we're making great strides. So we, we have these things happening. 
And uh, I started to talk about digital signal processing. This is an, a very important concept because it, it deals with the way we use AI today. And that is when you wanna build something, you wanna build a computer, even a computer, you wanna build a radio. You wanna build a uh, uh, astronomical calculation device. Uh, I'm trying to think of a, like in a, uh, for astronomy calculations, okay? What you would do is you would take what you wanna control and you take that and you convert it into digital signals using this thing I mentioned several times already, an A to D computer, analog to digital. Once it's in digital, you don't make a thing to, to me is very common, a filter that selects certain frequencies. You don't make something that's a window that controls things in time. Everything is done by the computer. Uh, it emulates the electrical circuits. That changed a lot of electrical engineering because you don't have to build a circuit anymore. All you have to do is have an A to D converter and then you program using the general word for this is the top up there, uh, digital signal processing to do, to do the task. And then when you're done, you just convert the digital signals to what you need to control analogly. So you have sensors that you pick up and then you have uh, transducers that take the electrical signal and convert it to motion or vision or whatever you, you need. But all the hard work is all done digitally. Uh, and it changes the whole mentality. There are limits on this. I'm gonna say that because we run in, and this has to do with the speed that computer operates at. If you want to do something in real time, you gotta do all your computations so quick that the user doesn't know that there's some digital computation, computation between the input and the output. So, but it's, it's amazing how fast things can be done today Audio is nothing. I mean, video is really nothing. We're going up to very, very high frequencies and we're able to process in the time frame it takes to not know that you're processing between the input and the, and the output. So th th there's, this is important. One of the things that is allowing to us, and I'll get to that in a moment, is what's happening with artificial in, in intelligence because it gives us a way of processing more quickly than we had before. Uh, rather than have a dedicated electronic con controller in appliances, uh, uh, we replace that with, uh, it becomes a replacement for electronic components. And that's the com process of doing the computing. And uh, I put a, a little bit in here on communications. Uh, we have the internet. We think of that as the, ultimate information access. I'm not so sure where we're going with that. But right now we have this interconnectivity between everybody. Uh, it really, to someone who's a little older than myself, I know the younger people here uh, don't understand that there's a revolution, just the internet is a level of a revolution because when you need information, what do you do? Well, what do you do when you want information? You just press on your phone and say, okay, what is the equation for the volume of a hexoid, hex type body? Uh, you know, you, you want an equation to do something and you can literally get this. I want to integrate this and this. Integration is a, uh, a mathematical process. And literally the computer will give you the answer, will give you the equation you need. It'll give you examples. Uh, information access is, you know, it's changed. Libraries still haven't adjusted to what's happened in, in terms of information access. Do I need a whole book when I, I can go and get that information directly in a matter of just a few words off the uh, internet question? Uh, you're saying, I'm gonna repeat it. You're saying the internet is an online version of life. Library. library. Oh, a library. Okay. Library. Yes, it, it, it is, but it gives you in little pieces, right? But you have the whole library. You have the knowledge of the world literally at your fingertips today. And you can get that information and it changes what you need to know. Uh, you know, people, sometimes people get over, uh, upset about this, but it's not a upset. You know, it's not fair. 
you know, you know this. <laughs> uh, why don't you learn it? Uh, but you, you just don't need to carry the same amount of weight around with you you did before. I like to make the analogy between watches and timekeeping. You know, if you're an educated person in the Middle Ages, you could, you know, you look at the sun, oh, it's around four o'clock, right? And of course, we were, they were a little looser in terms of what, what time is. You know, you, you were within a, in a, a reasonable period of time, you were on time for the meeting. Once you had, had clocks, then, oh, you're two seconds late. Uh, so th that has changed, but uh, a little bit. But uh, our need, our skill set is, is changing. And, and, and it's different on what you need to function. And we're, we're about to see a, a revolution. I don't want to spend too much time here. This just talks about the, the revolution, the Internet, where the Internet replaces libraries. Excuse me. I wanted to say how fancy you have Lexa series. Yes. That combines... Right, that is exactly what I'm talking about. So uh, you you can literally ask verbally, and that brings us to the topic this this whole conference. Our theme is about, and that is uh, generative AI, where the computer can interpret uh, human language and other human type inputs and give us a result without having to start writing programs to interpret the the language and the words. And uh, and there's a lot of, uh, I don't know if anyone attended the legal session, it was a legal session today. The question well, or comment? When, when we were younger, we used the library. We were pretty certain the information we found there was true. Can't say that. Yeah. Uh -huh. uh, I, so the skill set has changed to being able to determine what is true. I, I don't know about that. I, I don't want to spend a lot of time on a, a discussion of, you know, the possibility of getting errors. But I, you know, as a student and even reading books, not everything you read in books are correct. Uh, you know, there, there's more of a chance of that if you don't check the authority that is doing this because people can put up. And that's this is one of the problems we have that people put up bogus information, right? A absolutely bogus and incorrect information. So you gotta check the you know authority and make sure see the route in which that information is is coming to you. And and that's gonna be a, a, a one of the we talk about the I didn't put them all up here, but the pros and the cons and the problems that we have. The you know the, the roadway is not that wide. You still have to worry about those potholes that are in the uh, in the pathway. Uh, and, and there are a lot of, of questions here. Uh, you know, historically, and I'm just going over, you know, I, I talked about the convergence, and that certainly happened of television, telephone, and computers. They've all merged into one box today. And speech recognition, I remember, and, and I think we're going to, historically, I think we're going to see something like, that, something like that. I remember 30 years ago, you know, the announcement was, we got speech recognition. And they had some speech recognition, but it was far from perfect. But today we have almost perfect speech recognition, but it took a long time. I can remember uh, a lot of announcements. We've got the solution to speech recognition. And well, it really wasn't there. And then we've got the solution of speech recognition, but it is there today. We really do have extremely good speech, speech recognition. Uh, so all these things are, are merging together. And this be, brings me to really the, the, the thing that I use as the hook, if I can, to get you in here to the talk, and that is computers that think. And there's nothing that original. I just want to show you what the why uh, something is very likely to happen. Uh, what I have here is a picture of basically a one megabit memory chip, okay? And there are a million cells, actually more than a million cells in there of logic elements on that chip on the, on the left-hand side of the screen. On the right-hand side is a neuron. I've designed, pictured these, so they're roughly the same size, okay? So one neuron. Now, neuron has a lot of flexibility, has multiple dendrites, so a more flexible than the memory elements there in that logic. Uh, but size-wise, one 
neuron is about the size of a gigabit chip. And that's changing. That's actually, it, it, it's getting bigger. Uh, in other words, nor, one neuron is going to be more like a 10 gigabit chip as, as time goes by. Uh, it's amazing what's happening in this in this area here. So, and on top of that, the, and this is a very important factor, the basic logic element, because the neuron is basically a logic element. It makes a decision, and based on its inputs, it's more complicated than the simple logic element that we use, which says, okay, this is up, this is down. Uh, it, it, it has, it does more functions than a basic simple logic element, but that logic element is greater than a million times faster. Uh, uh, neurons, our biological systems, are based on uh, electrochemical process, and that's a slow process. Depending on some, some neurons can be faster, some neurons can be slower, so I'm kind of averaging things out here, but there's roughly, you know, speaking, about a, a million to one, it's not, it's not 100 to one, it's not 1,000 to one, it's on the order of a million to one times faster in your logic elements. And that is going to affect on how we communicate with whatever develops in our electronic intelligence, because the electronic intelligence can go so much faster than we can. And uh, that's part of the, the message I'm trying to bring here. OK, so one of the things that you don't hear talked about is there was a great breakthrough. How many people have heard about this great breakthrough in 2017? Anyone besides me heard about it? OK, got a few people. Anyone uh, else here? OK, we got a, a few of us here. And that was uh, this uh, what's called large language models, LLM, uh, which means that we can put, put uh, LLM as a collection of neural networks. Now these are electronic neural networks. They mimic what a neuron does, okay? Not exactly, they just they say basically, there's, there's a lot of little subtleties that occur with neurons in terms of the physical neuron, in terms of the number of times they click. Uh, but uh, basically it, it mimics, uh, a, a neural network mimics neurons. And this model, uh, this, LLM, as it's called, is designed to accept written language, and it could be the way our speech recognition systems work, as, as Eva, I think it's Eva over there, right, <laughs> uh, pointed out, we have uh, all these tools in our, in our homes that all we need to do is speak into them and ask our questions. Of, and and it, it basically does the same thing, because speech recognition converts the output of our speech into a written language that can be an interpretive, okay? And uh, and what this does is it, it gives us this generative pre-trained pre transformer. That's what we, we do. We, it, it programs itself to be a transformer. And this is the GPT break, breakthrough. And it was the first, to my knowledge, and, you know, Again, is this the right information do I have here? But it looks like that basically came from Google, was the originator of this work. Now, there's a lot of people working in this area and making contribution, but it looks like we look at when the breakthrough occurred and who did it, it was uh, came from group, group Google. And this occurred in, two, so remember, 2017. That's the breakthrough. The world is changing, and it really is changing. And... The, it, it, it had a, this concept, the LLMs had a profound impact on this transformers. Transformers are the, the, the process that transforms the speech or written material into meaning, uh, meaningful information. Transforms essentially change the landscape of uh, neural networks, basically, NLPs. Uh, so... We have these parallel processing transformers, and they, the, the, the part of what Google came up with allowed these this data to be processed in parallel. It also allowed the handling of longer range dependencies. We can focus uh, the, the system can focus on uh, on any part of the input and irrespective of its distance. So it allowed to 
to spread out these parallel connections. Now, obviously, I shouldn't say obviously, but you get people to take pictures of this is a, uh, and you can find this up on the internet. That's where I found it, quite frankly, is a model of how this process works. I'm not gonna attempt to go through all the steps just to make you, all I'm doing here is making you aware of this breakthrough and what this is happening. And this is allowing us to get answers much, uh, uh, much faster. And it's, it's, it's the secret, and if you look down here on the bottom, it's, it, this, the scale is the secret of reaching human-like AI. In other words, making a device act like it is human in terms of its response. And I don't think we know the full limits we're going to. This area is changing enormously fast. And in this, di this diagram here, this shows you uh, what's happening with these neural, parallel neural networks. Uh, every year, the size, you know, this is kind of Moore's law of, of neural networks, parallel neural, normal networks scaling uh, that allows the ALLM neural training to become more rapid and scale by large parallelism. If you look at the numbers here, you see how, how steep that curve is? It's almost like what you see, I hate to say this, but it, it, what you see for the amount of carbon increase in our atmosphere. Another uh, really important issue here, but this issue is an important issue too, because it's gonna to change the way we interface with machines in the future. There's just no question that these uh, uh, computers are gonna have a tremendous impact uh, in, in the way they interact with us and what they're gonna do and what we are able to do. And I don't have the philosophical answer, but when I looked at this, there was a, I forget, more than a 10 time increase recently announced beyond what's shown at the end of, uh, of this. You see where this chart is going off the curve? Well, it's increased since this chart was made at least 10 times. So in the number of of, of, of logic bits you have in these neural networks. They're, they're growing. And the secret behind the bigger they are, the faster they're the processing, the more complicated, the more sophisticated their solutions can be. Okay? So uh, I was going to talk about uh, here in terms of future trends, some of the things that we need to be uh, concerned about. So we have biology and computing. And uh, you know, I'm coming from the electrical. I talk about electronic uh, issues here and having an electronic intelligence based on how we know as electrical networks. But there's a lot of things happening in biology, uh, particularly in genetics. And as human beings, we have to be aware that our life can be really upset greatly, as the word it's extremely by what's happening in terms of generic, uh, genetic developments. Uh, and it's another area, you know, like the plastics, plastics, if you remember the movie. Uh, it, 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 that is a second front that we have to be aware of because that can change us what we look like, what is considered human, and that's from what can be done now in genetic sciences. Uh, it, we're still dealing with a biological system, but uh, it's one that I believe can have a tremendous impact and we have to be looking at that. We can't lose sight, be worrying about uh, just uh, uh, the uh, artificial intelligence and be aware that that doesn't exist. Another uh, place that I always like to go to as a astronomy buff is, you know, we say what, what affects intelligence? Are we gonna have this artificial intelligence based on electronic elements, or is what we picture as human intelligence gonna change due to things that are going on with genetics in biology, just biology alone? And then you have the question, you know, you have people who, who see the little green men who are coming in. I'm not a big believer in, in UFOs. And that's another talk uh, to, to deal with, but I'll ask you how many people believe that there's probably extra terrestrial intelligence in the universe besides us. And uh, I tend to agree with you, you know, 
uh, that it seems highly likely. Or every day in uh, astronomy, we, we, we receive more and more data about more and more planet-like uh, uh, solar systems and things like that. So, I mean, this is not the only thing. My point here is it's not the only thing that's going to change our image of ourselves and what we can be. The, the thing about extraterrestrial intelligence is that they're so, so far away, there's limited ways that they can impact upon us. We still start looking at the statistics. I, I don't believe that uh, we're going to have meaningful communications with extraterrestrial intelligence, but I think that there's a high uh, likelihood uh, in terms, and that, that's what SETI here is, uh, the search for extraterrestrial in, in, in intelligence, uh, that I, I believe there's still a high likelihood that we can't look ourselves as the only intelligence uh, in the universe. But how that impacts us, I'm not sure. But I, the, the, th the two things I do think will impact us in, the, in our living time frame is what's happening in genetics and what's happening in terms of uh, uh, com computers and the possibility of self-thinking computers. Uh, uh, when I started this whole thing, computers that think, and you can extend that, you know, life, and we, I'm, I'm not going to get into philosophy here. We can have a separate meeting after this as to what is life really mean. But uh, uh, interesting reading, there's this guy, Jeff Hawkins, who wrote a book on intelligence quite a few years ago. I haven't heard too much from him. I wanted to bring him in here as a speaker. He was the inventor of the Palm Pilot, the original, uh, you know, like uh, uh, little hand computer. And he made a lot of money on that. And he didn't know what to do with it. So he started this Institute on Intelligence. He wrote a, a book on it. And he talks about modeling the brain and understanding the brain. In essence, that's what we're doing here when we talk about uh, these networks. Uh, we're looking at models uh, uh, of the brain. And that one of the things that came out of, 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 of people who've studied this is that uh, reproduction is not the gauge of whether you have life, uh, but maybe consciousness is, 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 a, is, is a system aware that it exists, whatever that means. Is that we get into a big, another big discussion, which I'd love to have if we have time here is, what does it mean to egg, a, a, exist? I think I go to 3.30, uh, and I'm famous for going over. I shouldn't say that. Yes. We go to 3.30. So I only have a limited amount of time to keep going, but a, a little bit of, of time here. So uh, if, if we look at how versatile and how fast and how many connections are in our, 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 our brain uh, and what's happening with the ability of the new uh, neural networks that are being produced, these gener generative neural networks, we look at what they, they can do and where they're going, uh, their capabilities are very similar to the brain. And this is now my phil philosophy, but I, I look at the way our thinking me mechanism developed. And this is not, this is not a, a attack on religion or anything, but I think everyone accepts today that we're based in a si system that evolved uh, and it evolved from very simple systems. Now, you can religiously, we can talk about how that came about and, you know, does it fit in some sort of dyna uh, some sort of divine plan? But the fact is that we developed as a, a system. Now, when, from a biological system, th did the system become aware of existence? Uh, you know, at what level of life did it become aware, uh, aware of the existence, and when does that happen? And if we look, not just at ourselves, but we look at animals, I, there's no, no question in my mind, you know, having a, some cats and dogs in my life, things like that, that animals definitely know that they exist. In fact, they have a certain level of emotions. They have a certain, even a certain level of, of creativity. So we're not unique in that. And if we look at how does this process occur and when, that a biological life form, obviously 
there's no question that a biological life form at some point realized that it existed. I think how people will agree with me on that. There has to be a point, some point, you know, where the, the, the system said, oh, I exist. Now, when does that happen? You know, when you look at your windows, you know, windows is so complicated without having to go. As I f first started talking about this quite a few years ago, you, you look at the way Windows operates and Windows, which is nothing. It's like a, a, a toy compared to what we have today in terms of capability uh, of our, our, our networks and our logic. Uh, people did not. There was no one person to know how Windows worked. OK, so you have the system that's working. Uh, a lot of different logic elements uh, there, and it's doing its job. But in all systems, you have noise, okay? And so I envision that something is going to become aware of its existence, basically through some sort of uh, noise-like event. Some random event occurs, and you have this loop, and the loop doesn't go exactly where it's supposed to go, and all of a sudden, it develops a, a consciousness of its existence. I think of that in my own area of electronics, uh, if you're familiar with electronics, you have oscillators. Oscillator is a thing that generates an electronic signal, okay? Uh, how does an oscillator start? Uh, oscillators actually don't start by themselves. They need some sort of random event to kick them off. It's like if you, example of the squeech in an auditorium, you have a mic, you have enough gain to close the loop, but it, it sits there, it doesn't do anything, but then like a random click occurs, a tree, you know, the, the thing kicks off, it starts to oscillate. And even the basic oscillators, all you look at their designs, it, it, there's no one who's designing the, the kickoff of this thing. It depends on this random nature. And I think when you get a system that is so complicated, all you need is that one little click, that random event to kick it off and it starts to have this concept of consciousness. That's, that's my image on, on, on this here. So uh, if we end up having systems that are, are aware of themselves, what does that mean? And that's the one of the last sentences down here with the trees to make you aware this is complicated. It's not that simple because uh, we, we, our logic system runs so much slower uh, than the logic systems electronic-based logic systems. And we aren't even at the limit of electronic-based, how fast they can go. Today, we have a, quite a ways to go and things we can do to, to speed thing, things up. So uh, uh, a electronic system that's conscious and becomes aware of us, we have to be looking like, I use the example of the tree over here. You know, we can't communicate with the tree because the time frame of the tree. So good to see you, Eric. Everyone's worried about you. Uh, Eric's one of our great philanthropists, part of our committee here. He does everything. Thank you. Uh, here, I got to recognize Eric. Uh, so it, it's like, uh, you know, it's like us looking at a tree. It's even worse because, as I said, there's a million to one time frame right now between the logic elements going in a electronic base uh, system and a biological system. And so this is one of the problems. One of the things I recommend people to see is the movie came out a few years ago. I think it's about five years ago, Her. Anyone seen Her? It's about an operating system. I keep recognizing. And that's the first time I saw that someone really recognized this question of the time frame between something that is a electronic system working on an electronic time frame and the frame that we are are operating in. And so it's just another another issue to add to the things that we need to uh, talk about. And that pretty much, I'm at the end of my timeline here. Uh, I just say here that I, I tend to be interested in history. I, I, uh, I, I would say I'm a, I enjoy studying history and looking at what happened in the past. The next 500 years will be very different from the past 500 years. You know, we look back at what, when Columbus sent his ships out, and at that time, and there's a lot of similarity between society then. I don't believe if we look at the next 500 years, there'll be the same similarity. I just hope everything, we're all here, but it, I don't want to use the word scary, but there'll be a, a huge difference, I believe, 
and change that we have here. And I'm looking forward to getting to the 50th computer festival. Okay. And so we'll see what surprises we get. We have uh, a couple of years before we get to the 50th. Uh, one of the things that I, we, we used to predict, there are going to be more computers than people. Ha, ha, ha. I mean, that passed a long, long time ago. We have a lot more computers than people today. And the next question is a little bit more complicated. Computers could be the dominant species. And will we care? Big question mark. So I thank you.